Okay, so now I'm going to shift to another individual, Paul Rubin. This one I'm confident, well, actually, you might have heard of it, but probably nobody else. Uh, nobody, nobody knows Paul Rubin. This is a really intriguing case to me that is almost completely unknown. Somerton Man, just named after where he was found, has attracted a, a lot of attention. Uh, but I never figured out who the guy was. Uh, I'm going to say no. There are claims. There are claims, right? Just like people claim there's a dozen people who say they've deciphered the Voynich manuscript. There are claims as to who this guy was, but there's no smoking gun. Somebody found a passport photo, an old passport photo that kind of looks like the guy. And so an expert that can look at the kind of ears in the, in the photos and knows these things has concluded that he thinks it's the same person. But uh, I mean, it's up to you what you accept as proof, Did right? Did they dig him up and do a DNA sample or anything? Uh, well, the embalming process that was done on the body has left very little like, viable DNA for testing, um, although that has been talked about. Uh, there's a woman, and some speculate, is his illegitimate daughter. And so testing there could at least reveal that there's a, a connection. Uh, but as far as I'm aware, although there's been talk about DNA testing, none has been carried out. Uh, but he has a grave in Australia. Uh, I mean, he's, he's identified on the tombstone as the unknown man who was found at Somerton Beach. Uh, if you keep in mind, he was found in 48, right? So it's Cold War. Okay, and there are all kinds of interesting things. I mean, I could spend a whole lecture on him. He had like really well-developed calves, like as if he did ballet, or you know, sometimes that could be inherited, right? I mean, that's a, a genetic trait as well. But you know, physical analysis reveals some characteristics. Actually, he did have a rare type of ear. Okay, you know, um, you know, you have two loops in your ear. Most people, the one the one loop is bigger. His were reversed. Kind of a rare genetic trait. So I mean, there are some you know fairly unique identifiers. But uh, Paul Rubin, uh, I mean, Somerton Man could be a spy. Paul Rubin seems kind of unlikely as a spy. He's an 18-year-old uh, college student, uh, University of New York. Okay, he's found dead at the Philadelphia, near the Philadelphia airport, in a ditch. Okay, and it's uh, determined to be cyanide poisoning, and he's laying there kind of peacefully. So. Uh, the coroner suggested that he was murdered, that if he had committed suicide with cyanide, his body would be contorted and not positioned nicely. Okay. So, I got a little ahead of myself. So the coroner says it's not a suicide. So this, this guy's dead of cyanide poison, just 18 years old. But he's a chemistry major, right? So he could probably have access to cyanide or Maybe if he's just a freshman, you know, he's friends with somebody who has access to him. It's kind of strange. Okay. So, it was originally reported that although he was, come on in. So, we're talking about an 18-year-old college student that was found in the 1950s, dead of cyanide poisoning. He's in a ditch by the Philadelphia airport. Uh, the whole thing. So, press coverage is contradictory. At first, they say that although he died of cyanide poisoning, there was no container found anywhere near the body. Right? If he went for some reason out by the airport and was going to take some cyanide, there'd be a container, right? You see? You, you might think. Um, then later, they, they say they found a five inch test tube. And about five feet from the body. Well, how would you miss that the first time? Uh, so I, I don't know. I don't know what the deal is with this, but there's contradictory press coverage. Even how he was found. According to one account, he's found by a taxi cab driver. On another account, he's found by a, on a, by a soldier on his way to the airport to go off to some duty. So, I mean, that's a pretty straightforward. In one account, he's 18. In another, he's 19. So that's like a smaller detail, but if you're looking at these original newspaper reports, which is almost all there is on this case, at least publicly available, they contradict one another. Now, it gets interesting because when they're doing the autopsy, they lift up his shirt, and there's a piece of electrical tape going across his belly. And they pull that off, and there's a rolled up cipher message there. Okay? 
Now, his friends say that he did have a habit of sending encrypted messages. But geez, why wouldn't you have it in your pocket if you're just playing kid games? Why are you going to tape it to your stomach? Right? It's kind of odd. And it wasn't put there later because the mother recalls seeing him get some adhesive tape before leaving the house that morning. Okay? So it's not like you know, somebody killed him and then taped that there for some mysterious reason. He put it there himself. What's he doing? What game is he playing? Here's the message. Really aggravating that you can't read it. Okay? This is the best image I could find of it. I put in request to uh, Philadelphia police and the FBI and was completely ignored. Okay? I guess I need to do it more formally. I'll file a Freedom of Information Act request and try to get at the original. But the FBI got interested. This wasn't just a Philadelphia police matter because this enciphered message that was taped to this young man's uh, stomach contained the words Dulles and Conan. Okay. Now, they have multiple possible interpretations, but before we get to that, cryptography, cyanide, somebody's thinking it. This guy's working with encrypted messages. He dies of cyanide poisoning. Alan Turing. One can't help but think of Alan Turing. So I compared the dates. About a year and a half apart. I believe Alan Turing committed suicide. But if these guys died within a week of one another, in both cases cyanide poisoning, then I might suspect foul play. Even though it's you know, on different sides of the Atlantic, you know, maybe somebody's sending out a list of people to be canceled for whatever reason, right? Um, anyway, I think a year and a half apart, one's a suicide, the other appears to be a murder. I think Ruben appears to be murdered. So I, I just thought I would put that up there since it's something natural to think about. OK, so why is the FBI interested? Well, this cipher message contained those names, Dulles and Conan. So you have John Foster Dulles was going to become the new Secretary of State at that time. He'd already been designated, although he hadn't yet taken the role. Okay. And Dr. Conan was president of Harvard University, slated to become High Commissioner in West Germany. So, international ramifications. These are not just random names. These are people spies would be interested in. Now, David Hatch, I wrote this up, by the way, for um, History Today. So inside the agency, every day, you get to see a new history piece. They're just short, a page or two. Okay? But this was History Today on uh, uh, the 60th anniversary of Rubin's death. So in 2013, January 3rd. Okay? Um, anyway, David Hatch suggested some other possibilities for, for Dulles. John Foster's brother, Alan, incoming director of Central Intelligence. Is this 18-year-old talking about him in this encrypted message? Or Eleanor Dulles, a State Department desk officer for West Germany. Again, a German connection. Okay. So this is what I love about the NSA historians. I think I know who Dulles is. And then he comes up with more interpretations, right? So. Uh, uh, much deeper knowledge base. Okay, so another link to Germany. Ruben, instead of in his wallet having a picture of a girlfriend or something like that, has a picture of an airplane with the Nazi swastika on its tail assembly, and he was Jewish. So uh, that's hard to understand. Why would a Jew be walking around with a picture of a Nazi aircraft in his pocket after World War II, right? When he knows about the concentration camps and all the horrors. It's not. It's not something that would seem very appealing. Uh, it contained a notation on the, bank, on the back, France Field, Panama. Uh, the only other picture in his wallet was of this famous sculpture, The Thinker. I don't know if that's significant or not. OK. So is this guy a typical teenager? What else does he have on him? He's got a plastic cylinder containing a signal fuse which could just be a, a prop for magic tricks if he's into magic, OK. We don't have to read anything too nefarious into that. The casing of a spent 38 caliber bullet. What's that? A fountain pen gun? I think, what is this, James Bond? He's got fountain pen guns? What's going on here? But again, talking to David Hatch, it's not necessarily like I might imagine. I imagine a fountain pen gun actually shooting bullets. It may, but it could have been um, shooting pepper spray. So these things were not uncommon, apparently, in the 1950s. It was referred to as a gun, but it shot pepper spray. So OK, 
47 cents, not a big deal, but he left that morning with $15. It went a lot farther in the 1950s. What happened to the rest of it? Okay. And I don't know if this is misinformation or just a mistake or what, but he was said to have a science fiction magazine with him, Galaxy Science Fiction. The reports, and this is you know, in, in mainstream Philadelphia newspapers, say that this issue of the science fiction magazine contained the words Dulles and Conan, that those are names of characters in the science fiction magazine. And that also there was an article on cryptography in it by a Dr. Bell. Well, there is a Dr. Bell, E.T. Bell. Okay, he wrote Men of Mathematics. Uh, I recommend that to everybody. If you haven't read that, it's like the Hitchhiker's Guide to Galaxy. It's, it's inexpensive, highly entertaining, informal, and highly inaccurate. Okay, but a wonderful, a wonderful book. So that, that makes many of us fall even more in love with mathematics. You should read it and read it early. But anyway, E.T. Bell also wrote science fiction under the pseudonym John Tain. So he had science fiction stories in these magazines, right? But not in this issue. So I ordered this magazine. Right? I found it on AB Books, a used, web, used book website. I ordered it. I read the whole thing. Dulles is not in there. Conan is not in there. Bell is not in there. There's maybe an advertisement for one of Bell's science fiction novels, but there's no article by him on cryptography. So why are these claims being made? Is it intentional misinformation or just a mistake, a misunderstanding? What's going on here? OK, more contradictions. Uh, a homicide squad detective said that Reuben was failing his classes, and that's why he committed suicide. His dad says, no, no, he started college when he was 16. He got great grades without even studying. He was happy that day. A lot of times, you know, parents would be naturally be reluctant to, to admit that a son committed suicide. You want to live in denial and, and not imagine that it could have been that bad. But, uh, you know, if his grades were bad, I mean, that's a fact. That's not something a parent, you know, I mean, he lives at home. I think that the parents would know. So I, I tend to side with the parents on that. It sounds like a murder to me. So hopefully through a Freedom of Information Act request, I can get the cipher. And maybe we could you know, have uh, a little more information to figure out what happened. But a very intriguing story. OK. Uh, it's just death after death in this presentation, isn't it? Uh, what about the Zodiac Killer? Okay, This is a famous case. In the 1960s and 1970s, killed a lot of people. We're not sure how many. But he also sent cipher messages to newspapers. There's one he sent in three pieces to three different newspapers. I just showed part one. A high school history teacher broke it. He saw it in the newspaper and he broke it. His wife helped using the psychological method. Oh, you know, he's a killer. He's probably egocentrical. He wants attention. He's writing to the media. I think it begins with I. And it did. I think the word kill is in there, and it was. But you see more than 26 symbols. It was a complicated system. Sometimes L is replaced by this symbol. Sometimes it's replaced by this symbol. He had multiple substitutions for high-frequency letters. These are called homophones. Made it a lot harder to break, yet a high school history teacher did it. So pretty cool. There's a decipherment. You can find the whole thing. That's just part one, if you look online. He sent another message that nobody solved. It's the same kind of cipher, and it has attracted intense scrutiny from computer scientists using genetic algorithms and Nobody's been able to break this one. There's some claim decipherments, but I don't think they're legitimate. Okay, now I'm going to give you a little bit of insight, even if you've already read about Zodiac. I have a little something that I think will be new to you. Here's another one where he teases, my name is, and a string of cipher symbols. Would he really be revealing his name in an encrypted form? This fellow was never caught. Here he's claiming 12 victims. San Francisco Police Department, none. Didn't catch him yet. Okay. And again, a little cipher message, unsolved. Now, one message came with a map. So a map shows Mount Diablo, and there's Zodiac symbol. Kind of looks like the crosshairs in a rifle, right? But we don't know that's why he chose that symbol. It's speculation. <laughs> but there's Mount Diablo. And he says, PS, the Mount Diablo code concerns radians, and it looks like four inches and something along the radians. He's talking about radians. Does this look a little different now? Maybe not a crosshairs? Maybe polar coordinates? We don't know. 
Gareth Penn was the first one to examine this. He has a message about Mount Diablo that he's connecting to radiance. If you plot Mount Diablo and draw a straight line to one of the killings, and then draw another straight line to another killing, Gareth Penn claimed that's a radiant, that angle. Some other people online you know, do their measurements. and No, that's 60 degrees. No, radiant's about 57 degrees. Well, this guy's like, you know, in ciphering communications, he's misspelling animal and like, you know, I mean, they're just littered with misspellings. He spells bus, B-U-S-S. I'll let 60 degrees be a radiant for this guy, you see? I mean, I say that's within the margin of error. And I think it also depends on which map you look at, right, and how, how careful, where you draw your line, exactly how thick it is. I mean, it's, that's a small percentage error. And this murder was of a taxi driver. He got in the cab and told the guy where to go, OK? So he, was, he could take that guy wherever. He could commit the murder at any point. So coincidence that this is almost exactly a radian, you see? So I think this means something. I don't know why this guy would be talking about radians. Gareth Penn's book has this. I think that's an excellent insight into the case. But he has many other insights that I don't believe. Okay, a lot of times these people that are really creative and, and, and thinking kind of wildly hit some gold once in a while, but a lot of misses. Okay? So he actually identifies a Harvard lecturer, right, Massachusetts, as the murderer. And he publicly reveals the guy's name. And, and the guy's been featured in newspaper articles. He actually debated that guy on television. They had a debate. You're the murderer. I could prove it. I proved it in my, no, I'm not. I didn't do any of this. <laughs> so you, you got to imagine if the guy's innocent, as I believe, you know, how this must feel to have somebody accusing you of being this famous killer, right? But, but Penn's convinced he's the guy. Um, whoever the murderer is, I think this radiant theory is interesting. Now, in the 1990s, Zodiac was active in the late 60s, early 70s. In the 1990s, a Zodiac showed up in New York. He was killing people in Manhattan. Is this the same guy? He was never caught. It could be. And he was sending in ciphered communications. Not the same style, but in a ciphered message. Actually, uh, some people say these are naval flags. Does that look right to you guys? I'm not trying to pin this on anybody. Don't worry about that. <laughs> some, some flags go out of date. OK. Could be an older system. All right, thank you. And here again, look, NYPD 0, and then a smiley face, the zodiac symbol, 9. OK? So a crime reporter got a hold of this. This was sent to the New York Post. Just like original zodiac sent messages to the San Francisco papers, uh, the New York Post received this one, and their crime reporter, Kieran Crowley, tried to break it. Then he remembered his father-in-law, Alan Nemzer, was a World War II era code breaker. During World War II, Nemzer had actually broken a Civil War cipher. Still cool. <laughs> Didn't save any lives, but still cool, right? So he takes this message to his father-in-law, and together they break it. Context, context. Context is hugely important. We don't have word spacing. We don't even know to read across or up and down, right? We don't know. We hope the flags are letters. But look, this is the original document. He wrote, this is the Zodiac speaking. And that's how the message begins. You see that? What a fantastic crib. So with that, the whole thing unravels. This message is not identical to this one, but it does begin, this is the Zodiac. Okay? They eventually caught this guy, and he was way too young to have been the original Zodiac. He's a copycat killer. So like a copycat, he has, this is the Zodiac, right? And then he signed, uh, I thought it was this message. This was maybe a later message. He signed one of his messages, yours truly, just like Jack the Ripper did. And he's ripping off Freddy Krueger here. Okay? At the beginning of one of the Nightmare on Elm Street movies, it has the quote, uh, sleep, those little slices of death, how I loathe them, which actually comes from Edgar Allan Poe. So it was used in the, the Freddy Krueger movie, and then he misquoted it here. So just a copycat. He was uh, attacking people with homemade zip guns, right, and got caught. OK. So I thought that I would throw that in there because it's little known. Not many people know about this copycat killer unless they were reading the New York Post in those years, right? It's not known nationally. Uh, but that's a homework problem in my cryptography class. I don't tell them that, that this gives you a clue. I say, just you know, think about context. Figure this out. And some of the students are able to break it. OK. Uh, cryptos. This is a very famous unsolved cipher. 
uh, this is at um, CIA headquarters. So you can't just go and look at it. Right? You need to get on, the, uh, on a visitor list somehow. If you do, you know, they'll take a picture of you with it. But this was designed by James Sanborn and was installed in uh, 1990. Now, if you look at these two panels here, it's ciphertext, four different messages. There's the first. I added this line to separate the first message from the second. Then on the bottom panel, a third and a fourth cipher message. The right-hand side has these panels, which show an alphabet scrambled using the keyword cryptos. So that's giving a clue as to the system used. Indeed, the first two ciphers can be broken in that manner. You have alphabets that are scrambled with the keyword cryptos. Cryptos, you see it on every line. In my little example, I use another key, Gauss. Okay? So this system is kind of akin to the Visionaire cipher, if you're familiar with that. So when I encipher my first letter, if I'm trying to say, uh, dear so-and-so, I look at the D, D lines up with W. And then I go to E, I go down to my second alphabet. It looks like E lines up with M. And then I go to the A in my third alphabet, right? I keep using a different alphabet. First letter, I use the first alphabet. Second letter, second. Third letter, fourth letter, fifth letter. When I get to the sixth letter of my message, I go back to my first substitution alphabet. So uh, I have a little example here. And again, I don't want to take 10 minutes to you know, go over every letter. You have it to take with you. You have the handout. Okay. But this is how Cryptos was enciphered. So James Gilligley, who broke those IRA ciphers, broke the first three Cryptos ciphers. He realized the key word was palimpsest, where I use Gauss. The artist used the word palimpsest. Mathematicians know this word because of the Archimedes palimpsest. A palimpsest is when you take a book, like a manuscript, and you scrape off the ink, and then you reuse the paper. When paper was expensive hundreds of years ago, this was sometimes done. So there's a famous uh, manuscript of the work of Archimedes that somebody scraped off the ink and made it into a prayer book. And then they used uh, advanced technology to recover the, what had been scraped off. And we gained new insights into the mathematics of uh, Archimedes, like the fact that he had developed some integral calculus. <laughs> um, so that was on exhibit in Baltimore for a while. You could go to, uh, to the uh, Walters Art Gallery and see the Archimedes Palace. That was pretty cool. Crowded. I don't know. <laughs> I thought it would just be a few math geeks like me, but it was crowded. Like a lot of people were interested. Uh, anyway, so there's the first decipherment. And the second piece, the key was abscissa. And here's the decipherment. Now it contains who knows the exact location, only WW, which referred to William Webster of the CIA. Now the artist, Gilligley, actually not Gilligley, Sanborn, the artist Sanborn got very angry when Dan Brown incorporated this into one of his novels, flipped it upside down and had WW stand for Mary Magdalene, right? He was considering suing Dan Brown, but Dan Brown's got some pretty good lawyers. <laughs> anyway, uh, so that's a misinterpretation. The third cipher was transposition. Here's the decipherment. It's just a rearrangement of the letters in the cipher text according to a certain rule. But part four is unsolved. Nobody's been able to break that fourth part. Now, Gilligley was the first to break it, as far as we knew. But after he broke it, it was revealed that I think it was David Stein of the CIA had broken it like the year before. And it was published in a classified journal, Studies in Intelligence. So James didn't have access to that. It was an independent breaking. And then, what's got to happen after CIA is like, oh, we broke this before him? What's got to happen next? What? Ask what else they have. Oh, no, no, NSA's got to come in and say, well, we were before CIA. <laughs> so NSA was actually uh, the first to figure out these decipherments, even though it was located at CIA, right? Not the most convenient location for them. So finally, he's given a hint that this portion of the ciphertext deciphers to Berlin. Now, in the earlier parts, there's some typos. And Gilligley has, even though there was one or two, it was an accident, Gilligley has indicated that the typos were intentional in most cases and that they mean something. So here's my theory for that fourth part. He shifted from something kind of like a visionaire to a transposition. I think the fourth part is another shift. He says, people call me an agent of Satan because I won't tell my secret, right? A lot of attention, especially since Dan Brown's talking about it, right? So a lot of people that are not necessarily of a, you know, a mathematical background that are intrigued. I think it's matrix encryption. Because he's indicated that it's not just the errors that he made, but the positions of the errors. And these things are laid out in a grid, right? 
So I think it's, oh, he made an error in like row five, position 12. And then like five and 12 are part of the key of a, to a matrix that was used to encipher or decipher part four. That's my conjecture. That's far from a solution, but I'm making a call there. Okay, 1991, this isn't a cipher message, but RSA security relies on factoring being a hard problem. So one time they were offering $200,000 to anybody that could factor this product and tell them how they did it. It's a product of two primes. So, you know, a lot of my students don't think factoring is hard. You know, 35, it's 5 times 7. So to convince them that factoring is hard, I say, a, a big corporation is willing to give $200,000 to anybody that can factor that. Can you do it? And of course they can't. Right? When the numbers get big, it becomes very hard. So even though the prize is no longer offered, still, you'd <laughs> uh, be famous if you could factor this. A huge feather in your cap. OK. Uh, Ricky McCormick. Okay. Unfortunately, another murder victim and a, and a cipher associated with the case. We seem to have a lot of that. So he's found in a cornfield in Missouri. 15 miles from his house, even though he doesn't drive. And there's no public transportation that goes out there. No official cause of death, but 12 years later, the FBI was saying it was a murder. Okay, some background. He's 41 years old. He'd live off and on with his mom, his elderly mother. He was unemployed. He was a high school dropout. He did 11 months in prison for statutory rape. We don't expect that it's going to be a mathematically sophisticated cipher. Okay? Here's part one, or part two, we don't know which is which, but here's the cipher. After 12 years of getting nowhere, I mean, the FBI has a cryptanalytic unit. I mean, they work on these things, right? Uh, but they couldn't figure it out. So after 12 years, they went public with it, asking for help. There's another part. Now, again, contradictions. Now, this is from Wikipedia, but we had the claim that his family is saying that he played with ciphers as a boy, just like Ruben did, that other murder victim. But later in an interview, I mean, there's a source cited for this, his parents are saying that he, he could barely write his name, that he's, he was illiterate, that certainly he wasn't doing any encryption. So was it something he wrote, or was it something that was placed on his body? It seems. If you want to convey a message, uh, it seems like a strange way to do it. OK. The Phoenician. NSA has a retiree organization known as the Phoenix Society. So I served 11 months with the Center for Cryptologic History. On my way out, I, I joined the retiree organization. <laughs> right? It's funny. Say the forum said term of service. I put down 11 months. Right? They're like, OK, here's, here's your membership. right? So I get this journal in the mail. It's a lot of fun. Uh, anyway, this was an older issue. This is one I found at the Cryptologic Museum, uh, right next to NSA, wonderful place. A cipher message. Now, some family member added that box afterward. But let me tell you the story here. Now, you know, I passed some peer review to get mentioned here, although nobody seems to be certain if this is a hoax or not. Uh, there's so much murder in this presentation. David Rayburn takes a hammer, kills his wife and stepson, Goes in the basement and hangs himself. Okay? And then upstairs, the cipher message is found. Let's take a closer look. Like I said, that, for some reason, a family member <laughs> made that rectangle after the note was found. Uh, why would you do that? I don't, I don't understand. But that's the claim. So the hope is that this gives some insight. Now, it was published in the Phoenician. And again, the fellow saying, I don't know if this is legitimate or not, but this was sent to us. Hey, take a look. And Bruce Schneier, okay, uh, a leading public figure in cryptography, put it on his website. Again, saying, I don't know if this is legitimate or not. Over 411 comments were then posted by various people, including people claiming to be connected with this, friends of the family, etc. So there's a lot to look at here. Uh, all kinds of interesting hypotheses. You know, one fellow's like, oh, I have a list like this on a piece of paper myself. They're, they're codes to video games I play, computer games, right? I mean, it could be something like that. It doesn't have to be, you know, anything deep. But hundreds of comments at this site, you have the link. Follow it if you're intrigued. Okay, Klaus Schmey. This guy's a lot of fun. 
I, I have so many friends that are spread out that I wish they, I wish they all lived within a half hour of me so we could hang out. So Klaus Schmee is one of these guys, a wonderful person. Uh, he wrote uh, several books about cryptography in German. He's German, okay? Uh, here he is with the Voynich manuscript, <laughs> or a copy of it. <laughs> he made a copy. He, he browned paper with the coffee and such like this, and and made a replica, a facsimile of the Voynich manuscript. And he gives talks about it at math slams, like little competitions. You could give the most lively talk about math or science, and you know, yeah, five minutes. Uh, but. Uh, his cipher wasn't proposed in this book. It was repeated in this one, but originally proposed in an earlier book. We would translate the title to Code Maker versus Code Breaker. He got the idea that double transposition is a very hard cipher to break. And, I mean, we can make these claims, but he's putting his money where his mouth is. He's like, here's a double transposition cipher. I don't think anybody can break it. I'll be surprised. Yeah, it's an old system. It's a hand system, but even with computers, I don't think you'll be able to break it. And he's a computer scientist, okay? He's not a layman putting this forth. I mean, he knows what he's talking about. So far, nobody's broken it. Let me show you how this works, in case you haven't seen double transposition before. So here's a quote from Friedrich Nietzsche. Why don't we use Friedrich Nietzsche as the first key? So I write Friedrich Nietzsche right above the message. The message is written out in rows. And then I look, okay, like, do I have any A's here? No. Do I have any B's? No. Oh, I have a C. So I read down this column, T-N-O-E-S-T-D-U. That's how my cipher begins. And let's see, what comes next? There's another C. I read down this column. The next in the alphabet would be D, so I read down this column. So I use his name to peel off the columns in some different order. And that's my cipher text. But I write out the cipher text in rows and then do this again with a different key. So I read out now N-L-I-E. So it provides a pretty, thorough, a pretty thorough scrambling of the message. We get this as a final ciphertext. So Klaus Schmey's example, even though it was published in a book in German, is in English. I guess he wanted to make it available to more people. Most Germans know English, plus the English-speaking world, right? Uh, so no prize money. It's not going to reveal buried treasure or solve a murder. But it'll give you a lot of status. You'll impress people if you can solve this. Okay, so that was actually my last slide. I noticed the clock uh, doesn't move. No. So, hey, 1.15, that's when I was supposed to stop. Perfect timing. Thanks very much. Any questions? I love questions, please. What's the Latin long of the cryptos? The cipher 2 of the cryptos gives you a Latin long at the end of the cipher. Latitude and longitude. Yeah, I'm just wondering what was actually there. Did they find anything? Um, sorry, I'm thinking of two different things. Um, Dan Brown on the Da Vinci Code, on the hardcover edition, on the dust jacket, there's a latitude and a longitude. And that leads to cryptos. So people that were interested in that book, you know, notice that. They're looking closely at it. Then they get turned on to cryptos, which was played a role in his next book, right? Um, so... The decipherments, I'm not sure exactly what the artist intends by the decipherments, the ones that have been obtained thus far. Um, one is a clear reference to Howard Carter discovering the tombs of, uh, the tomb of King Tutankhamun, right? Uh, I see things, wonderful things, right? Um, so another appears to be a, uh, an allusion to the Philadelphia experiment in making a ship invisible to radar, okay? Um, if you do a Google search for cryptos, uh, the best website is Ilanka Dunin's. Ilanka Dunin, do you know how to pronounce it? She has a wonderful website, just very extensive, and you can see all kinds of speculation. Other questions? Yeah. So, um, personally, what's your favorite cipher? Ruben, even though I haven't seen it. I want to. <laughs> uh, because it's attracted so little media attention. If I file a Freedom of Information Act request and the FBI or the Philadelphia police turn over a box of records about this case, I could write a book on it, right? It was very intriguing. Were, were you here for this part of it? Yes. Okay. So for those who weren't, it's just a teenager, an 18-year-old. He started college at age 16, so a little bit of a whiz kid, chemistry major, found dead in a ditch with a cipher message taped to him, right? Uh, I mean, it's just very intriguing. Um, it might unravel into some kind of spy story. Right? Uh, I would love to write a true crime novel. 
know, and so, so that one intrigues me, but I gotta get the data. And part of the reason it intrigues me again is I have it to myself. Right? It's not like Zodiac where there are already several great books written about it. Uh, or a Voynich manuscript that you know has a stack of material on it, right? It's received so much intense study already, so it's more fresh territory. Uh, did you have one you liked the best? <laughs> I'm asking you questions. Now. All right. <laughs> um, any other questions? Okay. Thanks very much again.